my apologies again. It's lovely uh, to see everyone by Zoom and I hope you're all staying safe. Keep well. Hope to see you next year. Okay, could I have, uh, I'll just do next, it's easier. The images aren't coming up, are they? Why? I don't know. Why? Oh. Anyway, let what? me, ju I'll just oh, talk. You see, they're not coming up, are they? Yeah, why not? I don't know. Okay. Let me try other things. Okay, why, why don't I just um, say what I was going to say okay. and we hope the images appear. There is no rhyme or reason when you do these things on Zoom and they work fine and then they don't. So that's life, huh? <laughs> so I'll just say why I called it Back to the Future. I'm just going to continue because otherwise everyone will get fed up. Okay. Um, some of you know I spent about 43 years in art schools and universities. Um, and I think so much has changed and there are several changes. One is we don't have, as it were, separate textile art, art schools anymore in the UK. Most of them have either become design and fashion, design and technology, or have, like Goldsmiths, become part of a fine art department in a university. Universities have therefore emphasized research, publishing, curatorship, those things that have particular outputs. So I'll say that very briefly. But this is really dedicated to Audrey Walker, who became perhaps the best known after the founder, Constance Howard, of textiles at Goldsmiths in 1975. Ah, fantastic. I'm, yeah, I'm trying another way. <laughs> it's fantastic. And I want to dedicate this presentation to Audrey, who very sadly died on Saturday at the age of 92. And it was already a significant um, area of practice but Audrey really shifted it to become a Bachelor of Arts degree course. And it changed from being one solely dedicated to embroidery. You may know that in England, embroidery has a very strong history. And Audrey took this opportunity to really establish experimental stitch. It may not look experimental here, but at the time we have to remember when we go back in time, it was. And she really introduced this common practice now of being interdisciplinary. So the area was changed from embroidery to textiles. And certainly in the late 60s, it was important that Audrey tried to escape from the confines of what became very illustrative and the students that came wanted to be more adventurous. And I'll say two things. I am the last head of textiles there was. And Audrey and I had this in common. We both studied painting first. And I think that did make actually quite a difference. And one of the most distinctive periods then, from the late 60s through uh, Audrey's term, and she finished actually in 1988, they were very strongly grounded in drawing first. There were no set projects. There were no particular structures that prevented them from experimenting with ideas concepts, materials, and very well-equipped workshops. The workshops still exist in terms of stitch, in terms of print and dye, and in terms 
of a weave area that's quite small now, but uses the um, technological advantages of the looms from Norway. So it has shifted. But like most areas, and Virginia's covered it, it was a time of gathering different people, different voices and different experiences who had creative ambitions which resulted in the making of perhaps a very innovative and energetic department where certainly staff and students could really develop their own independent areas of research and often re-examining old techniques through museum collections and learning from history. What it says their narrative was a series of oral history interviews with the former head of textiles, which still exist as uh, DVDs and uh, a collection of artworks on those DVDs. I want to put this slide in because this was just um, the year before I arrived and took over from Audrey, but I used to be sent in to Goldsmiths as a visiting tutor to really discuss some of the shifts that were going on from this 97 electric performance with knitting. When you brush the jumper, of course, you set off electrical charges. And this was probably quite an early piece of experimentation. Next. Now, the department as was, was in an old teacher's training college in Southeast London. And the textile department as was, was set against what was the fine art faculty. And that physical proximity, of course, had a very intense effect to have both within the same space and was certainly in England, a very unusual situation because obviously students and staff cross-referred they discussed ideas, there was a lot of interaction and a great deal of discussion and argument. In fact, you could say there was a fascination with difference, which both united but also separated different but respective inquiries that really was the hallmark of Goldsmiths for those years. So really the freedom, the space, the lack of boundaries, the merging of disciplines, and the encouragement of individuality, these were some of the qualities which were referenced again and again by those who went through that department. There was also a particular emphasis on rigor, the excellence of the workshop facilities, the skill of the technical staff who never did actually produce any of the student work, the student work they always had to produce hands on from as soon as they entered the building. Now that's common practice. The other textile courses or departments in the UK tended to have technicians who produced the work for them. When Goldsmith started to do this, most of the others decided it was a good idea. The other aspect, of course, was the emphasis on a number of visiting lecturers. Fortunately, Goldsmith is in London, not the fashionable part, but certainly in London. And so there are many international visitors. And the other strength was the studio-based tutorials, the one-on-one, -on -one, if you like. Now, the Millard building was sold in 88, and it became part of the University of London. And why did that happen? That was really to save something of what was art education. It was a change in government policy, in degree awards. And so the University of London, the outpost was at New Cross. These are slides from when I joined and became head of textiles from 94 to 2002 in what was called the visual arts department. Certainly the BA textile programs extended the pedagogic principles of what was first set up by Constance and then Audrey. 
I continue the emphasis on interdisciplinarity. Technical teaching, frankly, was kept to a minimum, but we emphasize the value of mark making, of drawing, of expanding the repertoire of materials and those that might be incorporated, rubber, for example, let's say, into other processes. They could be print, weave, paper, felt. And these produce perhaps a very hybrid form, often very potent with ideas which touched on the biographical, the political and the social. These were the MA textile students. I can see there a gathering of students, not just from the UK, but South Africa. I remember Meta was from Denmark and Anita was from Sweden. Next slide, please. Hmm? Next, please. Thank you very much, Virginia. No. I'm sorry for this pressure on you. No, no, it's okay, but some, some... Is it stuck? Uh, yes, I don't know why. Okay. I'll continue. Up, 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 up. Yeah, okay. It starts. Is it this? Yeah. Yes. Um, Anne Barbeau was um, one of the first MA graduates from Chicago in the USA. The scale, perhaps, in my time became very large. It might have been my painting background or studying in Poland, but very large works, very simple. You can see, I think, the relationship between drawing, mark making and the thread. Critical thinking is something I introduced, of course, the period very much to do with examining uh, voice and biography, feminism, politics. And as well, we had creative writing, which became embedded in the personal practice. And that was important so various students from various parts of the world could really begin to explore their own voice, both in practice, the way they spoke, and the way they wrote. This is Ruth McDougall. Oh. Yes, that's fine. Next, please. Yes, for some reason it's... No. Okay. Thank you. This is Ruth McDougall, who really was very interested in text and voice. So these are the big works, uh, almost like spewing out your language. And I think the point is made, uh, Virginia made it, that many of the students who came from different parts of the world, Ruth came from Australia, became very successful in different walks of life. She particularly grew in terms of group seminar discussions, not just individual practice, but group discussions where work is viewed and critiqued. So I think it became one of the most popular programs at Goldsmiths, certainly by the time I finished being head, we had about 35 MA students and over 90 BA students, as well as establishing the PhD program, which I did in 19, uh, sorry, 2000. Next slide, please, if you can. Yeah. Oops. Oh, okay. So for example, Ruth did return to Australia and she's now the senior curator at Quagoma, and she specializes in the Pacific and uh, Papua New Guinea. And she curated half of APT in 2019. She's the little white woman figure in the middle. So she became one of those that took up the curial, curatorial challenges of examining contemporary textiles from indigeneity. Next, please. I think one of the significant things I might have done was the Boys Who Sew exhibition in 2004. This is the back of Hugh Locke. That was his first big um, exhibition contribution. And why did I do that? It was really to show that whilst historically maybe women had involvement in textiles, there was a whole new generation which continues of boys who speak their personal experience through sewing or different kinds of textile-based activity. Next, please. Okay. Now, if I was to go back to Goldsmiths again for a moment, one of the most significant things in education 
was that we set up the Constance Howard Resource and Research Centre in textiles. So, for example, the collection we have of materials, the library, the books, that was available not just to textile students, but for many other disciplines. Next, please. Oops, sorry. No. Oh. Okay, so for example, Fernando, who was from uh, Brazil, spoke several languages, now happens to live in Belgium. He did a prison project, um, mostly working with men who are lifers, for example, in Wandsworth Prison, which is an area in London. And this then became not just an exhibition in the centre, but also part of Boys Who Sew with Hugh Locke on the cover that was two slides back. Next, please. That was some of the examples of Fernando's work. And I put in David because David must be acknowledged for taking all the fantastic images that we have still as a resource in the center. I think one of the most significant things and it relates to your current exhibition and project, Virginia, is that Waves was 50 years at the time of textiles at Goldsmiths from 1948, which is when Constant came in, to 2000. And this was a selected exhibition of graduates, as you can see, both in London and Dublin. Next, please. Oh, oh. Uh, back. <laughs> yeah, sorry, but I don't uh -huh. know. No, no. That's it. Thank no. you. Okay. Now, I apologize because I'm not in the institution and cannot always get access to all the archive material. I've done these scans of what was the inside cover of Waves, which was really a selection of work from that period, 1948 to 2000. And I made the comment at the time that insisted that textiles can no longer adequately encompass the diversity of attitudes and forms that have ruptured really conventional ca uh, categories. So that any sense of common sense or safe ground assumptions about practice, so seemingly familiar as cloth, fiber or textile, is perhaps undone at the moment of an encounter between you and the work. And I've put in the next three slides which really highlight um, perhaps what I mean by this. This is Satoru. The little shot is of a self-portrait of him, which he did in 1988 when he was on the program. And now as an artist working in Japan, this was an installation shot from Chat, the Foundation Gallery in Hong Kong last year. So still very active and internationally known. Ruth was the curator, he's the artist. Next one, please. And you probably realize this is Alice Kettle, yes. who in fact did her diploma at Goldsmiths in the late 80s and is well known to many people as still working in contemporary stitch, but also with immigrant communities. Next one, please. So when Goldsmiths became part of the University of London, it was because art history was a recognized academic subject. Its influence as a discipline began to encompass visual and material culture. This was led by our great friend Sarat Maharaj, which meant previous classification and boundaries further dissolved. And I really like this text tale telling as a protein enzyme, which he did for my retrospective at that time partly because it kind of does a different map of engagements. So colleagues in visual culture, sociology, history and anthropology acknowledged many artists working with this kind of material culture that could push the periphery in a very different global world to the center. Now, the battle over names, critics, writers, theorists have really continued almost ad nausea. And to describe artists, makers, whose conditions of production have been traditionally situated 
beyond normative confines of both high art and a Western modernism. And I've written about this. I'm not going to speak to it now. It would take too long. But the next slide, please. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. For some reason, my but, keyboard is not working. <laughs> sorry. The, the, the last one. Not this, the back one. Back one. Yeah. But back one, please, if you can. I don't know. Oh, sorry. That's it. No, that's, that's it. That's I'm sorry, but my mouse is jumping around like us. That's it. Okay. That one. <laughs> yeah, one of the, I just wanted to add in both Sarah working with me and developing different kinds of seminar programs, theoretical programs. I had for 10 years the novelist and critic Pamela Johnson, who developed new models of creative writing, writing inspired by the personal responses to textile objects we had in the Constance Howard archive and Freud's mystic writing pad. And this was really because so many of the students who came from different parts of the world could find their language both through these objects, creative writing. So we had actually quite a few novelists that emerged from this program. Again, quite common practice in research to begin to explore these ideas, to shift it from just a theoretical discourse. Next, please, Virginia, if you can. I'm sorry. That's it, thank you. <laughs> so I suppose the argument here is that textiles became a place where new negotiations were always made. Practice, writing, research, speaking. And as we've claimed many times, no longer predetermined or fixed, but certainly the value of textiles as a primary source of knowledge, embodying a complex set of histories and practices, invited a range of speculations about their wider cultural meaning and social interpretations. Of course, this has a long history with textile production, socioeconomics, political divisions, manual labor, all sorts of activity. And I put this in because this is about disrupting archives. And I think even if students learned from the archives and the material collection, they also started to disrupt how archives came into being. And so there were many projects with anthropology, sociology, that really unpacked the archives in different ways to how a practitioner might have done it. But those were conversations that really did uh, emerge. Next, please. For example, this is Nella Mishic from Belgrade that took the collection of uh, Balkan, so-called Balkan inverted commas textiles and unpacked them according to her own personal histories. Next, please. And the Forging Folk, which I did with anthropology students. Magdalena is now working in Berlin. Gabriella is now working in Ireland. They come, they gather, they disperse. But really investigating the whole history of folk and its complicated relationship to textiles, practice and performance. Next, please. So you see the historic and you see their interpretations of it. Next, please. So Constance, as I said, set things up in 48. Um, I've given you the link so that at some point, if you're interested, you can go back through the links to the digitized slide collection and further examples of student work. Next, please. The other thing I mentioned was the international visit of different speakers. This is Narelle Jubilin. This is Barbara Lane. And that again brought in a whole range of ideas and people that students had access to. Again, fortunately in London, makes a huge difference. Next, please. Yinka Shonibari, who many of you know, who was at the forefront of really looking at trade, industry, and colonialism. And many, if you if you speak to him, 
will acknowledge the fact that having the textile area in close proximity to the painting area engendered all sorts of conversations which led him to work with these fabrications, these textile motifs about his own history of shuttle um, where he was moving between Nigeria and London, but via the batik trade from Indonesia uh, to Manchester. And that was probably one of the best memorial lectures before he became super famous in 97. Next, please. I was very honored when I retired to have Andrew Renton um, do the last, in fact, memorial lecture for Constance. And here you can go on to the sound where he's really thinking about knots and knotting. We always specialized in metaphors, I think, but the point is the ethics of surface. And that's probably where I would like to finish because I have five minutes. And one of the ways perhaps there have been shifts is rather than thinking of distinct techniques or even interdisciplinary practice is what happens with surface. To offer insights into the value of making. Next slide, please. And I put this in because this is an example, whether you like it or not, from Free's Art Fair in 2019. This was called Woven, curated by Cosmin Constinas, who in fact is from Romania, runs a gallery in Hong Kong. But he wanted to show how now these different artists from different parts of the world weren't necessarily coming to London or New York for education, but were beginning to explore indigenous histories, what he thinks of as underground traditions, what we might think of as subversive, but employing different modes of surfaces and weaving, either directly or expanded. And for example, this particular artist who is from the Philippines, really takes photographs and looks at the whole issue of dismantling the colonial gaze. So very linked to photography, uh, particularly in um, the photographs he was using from Worcester in 1901. So I think this is one of the, the things you see a great deal is dismantling the colonial gaze bringing in the experiences of that which might have been hidden from history. For example, we have a great strength now in Black British art, many of whom, like Sonia Boyce, like Yinka, like Hugh Locke, are using material, ethics of surface, if you like, to explore what they want to say. Next slide, please. I put this in because I am aware that many people um, you've mentioned Babinov, of course, and we must honour him in today's uh, proceedings. But the research centres that have emerged in our different institutions have been very significant because students have been able to access, remake and rethink those early projects by some of what I would like to say those who pioneered and experimented from the earlier decades to give new voice to these forms, often early projects or sketches, into full realized material form. Next slide, please. So this is our resource and research center. You can see what we have. It's a very um, idiosyncratic collection, but it is well used by all the different disciplines that still operate at Goldsmiths. Next, please. And just to finish really with Audrey again, from when she had her exhibition at Goldsmiths during that year. And it's worth, because it's being recorded and you have this slide, where she talks about wanting to be called a maker, rather than perhaps predetermining or predefining exactly what the Noman culture is. But I, my last slide is just a two minute performance by Claire Wright. I don't know if it will work. Um, you have to kind of press below the feet 
But this was Audrey and my favorite performance piece by Claire, where she does knit her toes with wire. And the knitting of toes with wire is a metaphor maybe for the strength of girlsness, which it took the oldest technologies in the world and made it contemporary uh, innovations. No, I'm not gonna work. I don't know, I think not, <laughs> sorry. It doesn't go below. I'm very sorry uh, that the slides didn't load and I couldn't put this on the screen, but thank you, Virginia, for trying. Thank you. You missed a lovely performance. Thank you.